Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, my guest is Roman Bogomazov from Wyckoff Analytics. We're going to talk about the NASDAQ. Obviously, large cap growth has been, uh, has been driving higher. The S&P pushing to the upside, really accelerating in the last hour. But the trends that you've seen in the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ composite, all rotating higher, confirming this short-term rotation at the very least from value into growth. Is that going to persist? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together, focusing on the message of the markets themselves. Charts and the price of, uh, of different assets really reflect all known information. That At least that's what the theory is of, uh, of visualizing uh, investor sentiment and psychology. And I would argue it's not just about the information, the data, the fundamental uh, data, the economic data, it's how people feel about it, it's how people interpret it, how they're voting with their capital. And uh, if there's one thing I've learned over my career, the most important thing you can do is follow the trends, follow the momentum, look at where people are putting their bets and, uh, and, and make assumptions based on those flows that you're seeing. We have a lot of great tools to be able to do that. I'm excited for, uh, for my guest today, Roman, uh, to talk about uh, Wyckoff. We're going to look at a little point and figure, which is good. I, I've mentioned to Ramon before the show started, I feel like we're under point and figured on the show. It's something at points in my career, I've used a great deal. So it'll be good to uh, to talk X's and O's with Ramon here in a bit. Now, coming up on this uh, show, we have some really good guests. We've, again, had some fantastic guests uh, this week in particular. Excited to talk to Ramon. We had Mark Ungewitter and Dave Landry this week with some really good uh, thoughts just on, on trend following, long-term perspective, short-term perspective. Next week on Tuesday, the 21st, we have Frank Capillary from Instanet. On Wednesday, the 22nd, we have Sam Stovall. But before we get to that, coming up this Saturday, we have a, uh, an Options 101 panel. This week has been Options Week on Stock Charts. We've had some great special programs uh, by Danielle Shea and Tony Zhang and Joe Duarte. If you missed those, uh, you know, please check out our, our YouTube channel. Check out Stock Charts TV On Demand uh, because they're really, really well done. A lot of great information and education. We're going to finish the week on Saturday, uh, noon Eastern, with an Options 101 panel. I'll be moderating a discussion with Price Headley from uh, Big Trends, uh, Lex Lutheringhausen from Trade Year, and Sean McLaughlin from All Star Charts. We're going to, uh, I'm going to be asking them the question if you're just getting started trading options, how do you go about it? What are some of the mistakes they've made that they've seen uh, other novice? options traders make. And if you've dabbled in that space, or if you're thinking about getting into equity derivatives, I think you'll find it, it'll be time really well spent. They all have a lot to uh, to share in terms of their, uh, their own experiences and insights. Uh, continuing on today with our market recap. So the S&P really, um, you know, pushing higher today. There's no other way I would describe it. The S&P closing around 4170. That's up over 1% from where we were, were yesterday. The NASDAQ was leading higher though with the NASDAQ 100 closing firmly above 14,000, up 1.6% today. This is pushing the VIX back to around 1650. And again, the VIX is either really low or really high, depending on how far back you're looking. If you look back at the last six to 12 months, the VIX is at long-term lows. If you look back at the last you know, six to 12 years, the VIX is still pretty high relative to where it has been in certain volatility regimes. Uh, we'll look a little bit at sentiment later in today's show. We'll look at the VIX along with some other indicators and, uh, and see what they're telling us about the current environment. Let's continue on, look at some of the other asset classes, and then we'll get into some intermarket analysis and look at some of the tickers that uh, that have come up in my own uh, process. So, you know, I'm often asked what my one chart would be, and I love to ask other people that too. You know, if you had one chart to get a read on the current market, what would it be and why? For me, I would say without a doubt, the number one chart to pay attention to is 10-year yields, uh, you know, looking at interest rates. I think the rise in the value trade, uh, you know, coming out of nowhere, was really the story of increasing rates for the first time in forever. Uh, you know, we've, we've all gotten very comfortable over years, if not decades, of a falling rate environment and what that means. Now, all of a sudden, in the last six months, we've seen uh, rates rotate higher. That has been a great tailwind to things like financials and, 
uh, materials, industrial, sort of those, uh, you know, reopening sort of, uh, of themes, infrastructure plays, et cetera. What's happened in the last month, though, is that has reverted back lower. And so in the last, you know, two trading sessions, you've saw, seen the 10-year yield go from about 165 down to around 153, which is where it ended the day today. The TLT, the bond price index we tend to use, ETF, uh, is up one and two-thirds percent today. So that's not unpredictable. And I think we've talked about the divergences that we saw in the charts of, of the 10-year yield and the TLT um, uh, but but certainly, I think that's the story. I just recorded a video for my own YouTube channel called Market Misbehavior. I'd encourage you to check that out later today if you uh, if you missed it. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the implications of rates coming back down after a period of going higher. Gold prices up today, and uh, you did, you heard that right. Gold prices up today. This is not something I'm used to saying. The entire commodity space uh, higher essentially, but gold. Uh, the GLD up around 1.6%, silver up 1.9%. You know, the XAU doesn't look horrible anymore. I don't know if it looks great, but it doesn't look bad. Uh, and we'll look at that chart here in a minute. Cryptocurrencies, by the way, are higher with Bitcoin accelerating to the upside, uh, ending today's equity trading session around 63,500. So looking at the S&P 500 chart, right? I mean, the, <laughs> I'll go back to what mentors of mine have said. Paul Montgomery, who's a legendary technical analyst and published a newsletter called universal economics for it had to be 50, 55 years before he passed away, unfortunately, a number of years ago, um, you know, he, he would say the most bullish thing the market can do is go up. And again, if you're doubting what you should be doing in this situation, I, you know, I will tell you based on, you know, my experiences, you've seen plenty of indications of internal weakness, you've seen divergences, you're seeing moves not confirmed by things like micro caps and small caps. But at the end of the day, the S&P 500 is going higher. And that is the main benchmark that most institutions and in reality, most individuals should most likely use as a way of understanding the equity markets. The trend is higher. We've made a new all-time closing high today. Uh, and so as, again, when the market continues to make all-time highs, the trend is positive. And that is not open to debate. That is factual. That is what's happening. And until that stops happening overall, I would assume that the path of least resistance is up. You know, it's funny. I think so many of us, and, and you know, following the traditional playbook, have seen signals of weakness. So for me, I'm leaving this pink line on here to remind me the divergence that seems so perfectly clear on the chart. Higher highs, January, February, March, lower peaks in momentum each of those months. That has resulted higher as the uh, as that pattern has broken. Momentum has gone and, and gone uh, to new uh, highs. As the S&P itself has gone to new highs, 4,000 was a significant level of resistance and it blew right past it after pulling back to the 50 day. So overall, the trend is, uh, is positive. I still think we are certainly well overdue for a eight to 10 percent correction, if not a little more. Um, but we are certainly not seeing it today. And again, I, you know, the pain we often would talk in a, in a former firm of mine, the pain trade, what the pain trade was, what what direction the market could do that would cause the most pain to the most people. And it certainly seems like a lack of pullback is certainly the pain trade right now. We keep pushing higher in a way that doesn't make a ton of, uh, of sense to, uh, to, to myself and many others. Let's go through very quickly some other themes and we'll talk about some of the charts that have come up uh, today. Real estate, the number one sector. So as always, I, I remind people when you think stocks are higher and then you start to naturally say, well, obviously technology, consumer discretionary, those are the stocks, those are the sectors that did well, not the case. So remember, focus on what actually is happening, not what should happen or what could happen. Real estate, number one today, followed by technology and healthcare. Healthcare was actually the number one sector for much of the day, if I remember right, but came off here toward the end. Energy, financials, industrial, sort of those cyclical sectors are down at the bottom. Financials are an interesting one because it's such a heavy um, uh, finance, uh, uh, earnings week for financials. You had a number of the banks um, reporting in the last uh, couple of days. Yesterday, we had JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, today Bank of America, Citigroup, also asset managers like BlackRock, um, uh, Wells Fargo, others. Uh, again, these are you know some different different types of firms that I'm throwing around there, but uh, many of them. And again, overall, if I'd summarize it, I'm not an earnings analyst, but overall, uh, things seem net positive, fairly encouraging, but the stocks are not necessarily going up. And again, I think it's more about rates coming down that's uh, putting pressure on those. It's less about uh, their earnings. However, some of them not doing not doing too badly, right? And so it's worth looking at some of the um, some of the charts. Wells Fargo, for example, reported yesterday before the open, uh, you know, had a nice move higher and actually and finished today pretty strong here, up only 0.6%, but it had come off for uh, earlier in the day and really rallied to close in a position of strength. 
Um, you know, so all not not bad. Here's uh, BlackRock, which is another one making a new uh, 52 week high today up 2% after uh, reporting earnings before the open. You also had things like uh, airlines a little less impressive. So this is uh, Delta Airlines DAL, which closed down 2.8%. You know, the airlines in general have been a little bit frustrating, but you've seen this nice slow and steady gain over the last uh, six or eight months, uh, a number of pullbacks to the 50 day moving average and we're right back at that point. So in this sort of chart, you know, when that happens, that's okay. It's not a bad thing. Uh, and, and arguably it's a good thing when in an uptrend, you see higher highs, higher lows, you see the price come down to an ascending 50 day moving average. You see the RSI remain above 40. That's pretty much like a buying opportunity within a bull trend is sort of the general way to think of that. When that stops happening, we start breaking the 50 day, we start breaking RSI 40. That's when I would think you need to rethink the assumption that this is a long-term uptrend that's just gonna continue and continue. So now all of a sudden you have Delta that has stalled and failed to make a new high in its most recent attempt. Now it's testing support. The question is, does the 50 day hold, does 45 hold, which would be really, really be the low from late March, this RSI 40 hold. And that's why it's an important chart to watch right now to see if those levels are able to, uh, to remain stable or not. Finally, we need to take a, a quick break here. It's worth noting gold popping here, um, you know, making, uh, you know, failing to make a lower low on the GLD at the end of March and now making a new swing high, which means things like the GDX are starting to show a little signs of life here, right? If you draw a trend line from uh, the previous highs, we're just starting to break above that. We've now made a higher low and now a higher high. Interesting space to watch as the RSI gets back above 60 for the first time since last summer. I'd be looking to see if there's potential further upside there in gold. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with Roman Bogomazov. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together. Try to make sense of things in uncertain times by focusing on the message of the markets themselves, the reality that is reflected in price movements. As a reminder, we'll do another mailbag segment on Friday's show. We would love to answer one of your questions on the air. Shoot us an email with any questions that come up in your own charting, in your own analytical process. Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. You can tag us in a comment on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. On our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. And again, we'll do another mailbag segment on Friday's show. Also, as a reminder, Stock Charts TV on demand, our new on demand platform is out. Go to stockchartstv.com, use your email, set up a free account. We're also on all the app stores. It's really well done. We're excited to bring you all of our great content, our great hosts, and our great guests. Having said that, I want to welcome uh, joining the show once again, Roman Bogomaza. Roman's coming to us from the San Francisco Bay Area, founder of Wyckoff Analytics. Roman, welcome back. Well, thank you so much. And it's always a pleasure to chat markets with you, David. So we've had this rotation, right? I mean, we've all got very comfortable with the value trade starting to really work with things like financials and energy exploding to the upside. Now we've had a bit of a reversion where those spaces coming down and all of a sudden the NASDAQ rotating back higher. Now you're an expert in Wyckoff analytics, which I always describe as sort of a framework to make sense of things. Talk us through this chart looking at the NASDAQ. Well, I wanna communicate two ideas uh, in this very short presentation. First of all, what is the trend right now? It's still an uptrend. And even though you, know, you mentioned a lot of divergences, a lot of uh, preconditions to the potential decline that people were commenting on, throughout the last months, uh, we still don't see the result to the downside. So uh, a trend uh, is up and until we see a meaningful change of behavior, we still should be positioning our portfolios in the direction of the overall market. The second idea is more about the rotation uh, and the change of environment in the uptrend itself. So for instance, if we would look at the low of the COVID reaction, uh, which was in March uh, 23rd, that was the lowest point. We see uh, an original accumulation right there. And it's more visible, by the way, on the PNF chart, just because of the volatility functionality of the PNF chart. 
uh, when you go to the vertical chart, you will not see the same type of price structure. It's going to be more condensed. So we're seeing how institutions are uh, quickly and urgently buying at the COVID low, and then they are buying on the way up. So if the, major the majority of buying is happening on the way up, we're definitely seeing a lot of outperformance by the uh, NASDAQ 100, by the growth stocks. Um, and then something changes. Since September 2nd buying climax, uh, we are going into the rotational mode where value becomes more attractive. And I think this is kind of a challenge for all of the money managers this year. Last year, we just follow in the trend of the growth and we definitely outperforming the market. But I think that this year it's going to be more challenging to uh, outperform just because of this rotation. And David, as you've said just uh, at the beginning of the program, there is a mini rotation back into the large cap tech stocks. So stocks like uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Tesla, and NVIDIA. We see a lot of uh, Wyckoffian like sprints, test, sign of strength in the trading ranges. And then we're seeing uh, an ability to come to the resistance and overcome this resistance. So NASDAQ is still very interesting at this point. I think there is more selectivity right now uh, in the money management work with your portfolio. So you have to be more selective. Whereas before off the COVID low, it was much easier to do the selection. Um, so that's why I wanna bring up today the NASDAQ chart, David. It's, it's a beautiful illustration, and I, and I love what you said earlier about the point and figure chart. You know, sometimes it, the things appear way more clearly on the point and figure chart than on the regular bar chart. It's probably because it just gets rid of some of the noise, right? Absolutely. Um, but one thing I would I would note, you have some of the targets highlighted. I'm guessing this is based on the horizontal count of some of those patterns. Is that right? Yes, horizontal counting is um, somewhat of the... Uh, forgotten art. So uh, we are so happy just, you know, to have it uh, in our curriculum um, and you can, you know, study it with us. Uh, basically, the whole idea is the measurement of the causality, which is created by the volatility of the trading range, where um, an institutional accumulation is taking place. There are certain ways of how institutions function in the trading range, where they perceive value and there is enough liquidity, and where they are starting to buy at the support levels, and that produces rallies, then they stop, that produces uh, pullbacks, reactions, retracements, and that's how the trading range is being created. Um, and then we could measure that causality and project the effect, the potential effect. And one of the important things here is not just to get the numbers for that effect, but also to correspond those numbers with the next trading ranges that are gonna be at the higher level and to seek those targets as confirming targets. So see here, here we see 16,100 uh, uh, 16, uh, from the original accumulation as our target which is in close proximity to 16,700 and 16,800 uh, for the two trading ranges that follow that. Boy, with so some potential upside here, right? With, uh, with stocks, I, so we only have about 30 seconds left, Ramon, but I'd love to think about, you know, given this, I mean, it certainly seems like an encouraging, uh, you know, framing of the of the NASDAQ, which I totally get it. And I, and I see the accumulation phase or the reaccumulation. What would tell you that this is broken or that this is, not playing out? Would it be a break of support? Would it be rotating below some particular level? Or how would you think of that side of it? Yeah, I would oversimplify this uh, whole idea, which is a great question, by the way, David, in terms of what should we see? So mm. usually I, I, I say that we need to see the break of the price structure on yeah. the increased selling. Got it. It's all about following the price. Roman, it's awesome to have you on as always. I, I appreciate so much how you lay out the, the thesis and, uh, and bring some of Wyckoff's expertise to, uh, to light. Stay safe, be well, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, David. That's Roman Bogomaza. Roman runs a firm called Wyckoff Analytics. And, and again, what I love about Wyckoff, it's, as I always describe it as a framework to sort of describe you know, market activity. We interviewed uh, Bruce Frazier not too long ago for our current season of Behind the Charts and uh, you know, uh, reminded me anytime I talk to a Wyckoffian like Roman or Bruce, I, I make a note to myself, must look at more point and figure charts because I at times I've looked at them way more often and they simplify things in such a great way. If just and, and I would argue the one, you know, one thing that I do use that's point and figure uh, oriented is the bullish percent index. And that's the other thing I tend to jot down is 
make sure I'm looking at the bullish percent index, which basically aggregates how many in a, in a universe of stocks, how many of them are in a point and figure buy signal at any given time can be very helpful as a uh, breadth indicator. It's a great, great uh, chart and description by uh, Roman. Our next segment today is called Getting Sentimental. So as you probably know, Wednesday and Thursday, a lot of the weekly sentiment data gets updated. And so it's nice to check in on where things are at. You know, it's in, you know I think you know, going back to, to Roman's comments, you know, the, the trend is up, right? And, and we mentioned at the beginning of it, regardless of what you think should happen, the S&P keeps making new all-time highs. And when as long as that keeps happening, you better be bullish or at least positioned in a way that you're benefiting from the market going higher. And, you know, as we've talked about, I, you know, it's, it's tough for me to think about aggressively chasing some of these breakouts. However, I, I certainly am not seeing a reason to take a lot off the table yet in terms of the trends that are just following through to the upside. There's sort of a, a lot of uh, a lot of upside movement. Besides price, we have breadth as a way to qualify what we're seeing with the price trend. And then the third piece for me is sentiment, which is ways of qualifying what we see with those first two. So, you know, some of the more anecdotal measures of fear and euphoria and desperation, that's what sentiment indicators kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, display for us. We're going to get three types of sentiment as we as we normally do. The one is volatility. The second one is going to be survey data, a couple of different surveys. And the third one would be put call ratio. So essentially looking a uh, different way at the options market and looking at, uh, at bets there. Um, you know, if you missed my interview earlier this week, I think it was on Tuesday with Mark Ungewitter from uh, Charter Trust. We talked in particular about the VIX. His chart was fantastic. I'd encourage you to go watch it because it was going back like 20 years on the VIX. And his point was, you know, the VIX is down a lot right now, but it's really not that low relative to what it has been in other times. Now, what's funny when you look at the chart of the VIX is it keeps going lower, right? I had this blue, uh, you know, sort of area highlighted indicating that VIX 20 was sort of the support level, right? The, you know, in, in upswings over the last 12 months, we'd get down to around 20 and then the, the VIX would, uh, would go higher. And it was, again, not 100% of the time that it's calling every major top by any means, you know, plenty, plenty of times the volatility remained low. Uh, however, it was an interesting way of indicating when the trend had gotten a little bit ahead of itself and when fear was essentially, you know, very low. And then you can see, obviously, the spikes in the VIX tend to coincide with the pullbacks that we see uh, in the price. So this is changing. Now, all of a sudden, we're getting to a VIX in the, in the upper teens, and this is looking a lot more like the range we had in 2019 or even in previous years. It's almost like we are changing out of the 2020 uh, range, which again began with a huge spike to a, you know, a, a, an all-time long-term high in volatility up in the 80s, coming back and settling this range essentially between 20 and 40. I think that's uh, that's actually different now. We need to recalibrate our thinking about volatility. Maybe in this lower volatility range, where we're settling back into what a normal uh, trending phase may be like a 2019 and, uh, and and think of that new level. So I'm always cautious about range bounding the VIX. It is not naturally range bound uh, and content to have different uh, different phases. So certainly look back at the longer term history of the VIX. You can see how low it can go and how we may just be going into a different, uh, you know, different standard for that. Um, you know, second look at sentiment is more survey data. And the uh, AAII survey is the main one that I would use to look at uh, at surveys, there are a couple others that people pay attention to: investors' intelligence, market vein, or others that I've used at times. Um, I, I think the AAII is as good as any. It's a, again, it's a relatively small group of individual investors, weekly, every week, voting bullish, bearish, or neutral on stocks. And in general, we look at the bullish reading, uh, which is in green; the bearish reading, which is in red. We don't show the neutral rating, but that's essentially the the uh, remaining amount when you when you add these two together. And then here we're looking at the spread between bulls and bears. What you've seen in the last couple of weeks, and, and the AAII survey came down a little bit this week, down to 54%. Last week, it was around 57 or 58, which is one of the highest readings in a long time. Um, you know, so there are only a couple of times when we've been in the, uh, in the 50s uh, in the last five years. The one was late 2020. The other time was late uh, 2017, early 2018. Uh, and again, so what you can see when we really spiked higher in the in the uh, in the survey here in early November, indicated to me that wow, we're really getting an upside extreme. Maybe that's the euphoric sign that we've been waiting for. But you can see how the market has just continued higher for the next four or five months, even you know given that euphoric sentiment. That's something you'll see if you look back at the historical data. You know, it's not it is not. I wish it was as easy as saying when bulls hit X percent 
um, you know, that's it. And all you need to do is sell and you're done. What I would, what are the way I think of it? And this is why sentiment is third in line for me. Sentiment conditions being euphoric tell me to be wary of uptrends and to look for signals of breakdowns. But that is the key, right? It's as Ramon was mentioning, it's, you know, what, what do you look for to tell the market stops going up? Well, it stops going up, starts going lower, right? You break down in some meaningful way that suggests to you that there is a rotation. There's a change of of character, a change of dynamics in the uh, in the market. So the sentiment levels that we've seen now are similar to other periods where we've had very, pretty euphoric or how, how I would describe euphoric sentiment when the bulls are above 50%. This does not mean the market is topping out necessarily. What it does tell me is we are in the conditions where I'm looking for signs of rotation lower. And that that's the, the wary level that I'm at right now. The name exposure index has actually gone steadily higher in the last couple of weeks. This has been down to around 50% which anecdotally suggests that uh, you know, money managers are sort of tapping the brakes, taking some off the table, but you can see that that's rotated much higher in the last, uh, in the last couple of weeks. So indicating that actually there's a, there's a follow through to the upside. The Rydex flows are at all time lows, which is a, you know, a higher point in this, uh, in this level, which in, in this chart, which indicates that you know, basically um, you know, individuals are more bullishly positioned than they have been in a, uh, in a very long time. But that's about all the time we have. I'll just highlight the last thing. The put call ratios for me are not at an extreme. You know, so when you see the market making new uh, long term highs, put calls not at an extreme. It tells you there's not necessarily that euphoric, uh, you know, danger sign that you might have seen back here in December and in January. What's interesting to me, though, is the market has continued to go uh, higher here at the bottom clip. But the uh, the put call ratio is not going any lower. It's actually rotating. Uh, you know, it's actually slipping up on this chart, which uh, which which indicates that uh, there's less and less um, you know confirmation of that uptrend. Might be an interesting dynamic to uh, to watch and monitor going forward. That's it. That's all the time we have. We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three three charts. Three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is what I call the new Dow theory. This is looking at the S and P 500 and the Nasdaq composite. I thought Roman's illustration of the Nasdaq 100 is is uh, is very appropriate. I, I can't disagree with what he's saying, and and there are certainly plenty of signs of strong trend and potential for further upside. It's interesting to me to see which indexes have broken to new highs already, have confirmed upside, and which ones have not done it yet. Um, you know, the Nasdaq uh, 100 sort of testing uh, new highs. The Nasdaq Composite. The question is, can it get above? Uh, its previous uh, highs as well. So the S&P going to new highs is an asset composite index able to confirm that and break above its February high. That's what I'd be looking for there. That would be a Dow theory confirmation or new Dow theory confirmation, to be honest with you. Chart number two is the micro cap index. While the NASDAQ, while the S&P rotating higher and the S&P making all-time highs, you know what is not making all-time highs are small caps and micro caps. When I forget what's happening in the world and I just look at the chart of the micro cap index, I'm seeing it more of a bearish read. I'm seeing uh, this bearish divergence, higher highs February to March, lower peaks in momentum. Again, we saw some of that with some of the um, some of the other uh, charts. Some have worked out beautifully, like the uh, the the trend, the um, divergence in the ten year, the divergence in the TLT, all have played out as expected. We've now made a lower peak in the micro cap index is now below its 50 day. Once again, the question is, does it break down through some of these swing lows? I think the micro cap ETF IWC getting below 135 would be uh, certainly a danger signal looking at the RSI uh, as well. So interesting to see, obviously large cap growth doing just great. If you look at the chart of uh, the IVW, which is a large cap growth ETF breaking to new highs, but micro cap sort of the complete opposite, not confirming that. Finally, again, there are a number of sentiment readings we we, we walk through here, and and one that uh, that comes to mind for me is the the name exposure index rotating back to the upside. So this was down around 50, 60 percent for a couple of weeks, which indicated money managers were taking their foot off the accelerator, or at the very least, tapping the brakes maybe uh, a little bit and slowing down. And uh, what we've seen now in the last two weeks is that go back up, nearing 100 percent, which is more of a euphoric positioning, you know, net long or leverage long for stocks. Folks, that is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Get your questions to us via email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. I want to thank Roman Bogomasa from Wyckoff Analytics joining us from the San Francisco area today. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. 
If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.